Put on your grayest suit and hold on to your wall desk. Today we're talking about Brazil. Science fiction, or whatever Brazil is, is usually a warning. It's a close reflection of our world in most ways, with a few differences that could happen if we let them. It's hard creating a truly frightening dystopia when our world is so messed up. So if you wanted to scare people, you could just present them with a slightly exaggerated version of our world and subtract anything that makes it good. Brazil is a kind of funhouse mirror to our world. There's the regulation and criminalization of practically everything, the infinite jurisdiction of the state, the control of information, and other ways I'll get to later. I'm going to describe the world in Brazil, but see if you notice when I'm also describing our world in 2024. These parallels are key to understanding what Brazil is. Director Terry Gilliam said in an interview he based the things we see in Brazil on things happening around the world at the time. Even the stuff I thought was pure sci-fi, like charging you for your own arrest and imprisonment. It feels like a terrifying but distant world when it's our world with its insides on display. There are some great videos about Brazil on YouTube, my favorite of which I'm linking to in the description. But what most of them miss is this totalitarian system that rules over the world of Brazil is not fundamentally different from ours, nor should it be considered corrupt or mismanaged. The state is and has always been a system built for the purpose of oppression. The state in Brazil is just very efficient at doing what all states do. The propaganda is effective. Surveillance is ubiquitous. The police are invincible. Imprisonment is rapid. The charging and processing of prisoners is a continuous flow. And no one is really treated as human, so agents of the state don't feel bad for what they do. Brazil is what happens when bureaucratic control is extended to every aspect of life. According to Max Weber, the purpose of bureaucracy is to make the operation of government run smoothly. It divides the labor of governing, making it more efficient, stable, and rational. The question is, do we want these things? If we understand the state as historically a tool for oppression, we wouldn't want to make it more efficient because then it becomes more efficient at the processes of oppression. Bureaucracy makes things rational, which sounds good, but watch Brazil to see what it means in practice. Or read Max Weber. Instead of utilizing traditions, emotions, or values to motivate behavior, in a bureaucracy people use rational calculation. Weber called this increasing rationalization an iron cage that trapped individuals in systems based solely on efficiency, rational calculation, and control. Brazil is a world planned by bureaucrats. Everything is designed for rational efficiency, which is why everything is the same, with no unnecessary, costly, distracting things like art. Spaces in Brazil feel either cramped and ugly or way too big and exposed. There's no imagination, no difference, just the most efficient use of space, the minimum necessary for human needs. There's no room for anything that makes life worth living. That would be inefficient and irrational. They've apparently just recently thought to offer to install different colored ducts in people's homes. Which reminds me of the claim you have choice under capitalism because you can choose between Coke and Pepsi. Oppressive systems build walls around you but let you choose what color they are. In Brazil, the walls feel particularly high. We get the impression that there's no escape from the reach of the state, which means the total enforcement of strict, onerous, unnecessary, self-serving regulations that take away every last shred of a person's freedom. This whole system of yours could be on fire, and I couldn't even turn on a kitchen tap without filling out a 27B stroke six. In the offices, we see apparently never-ending corridors and rows of desks, as if to remind us work never ends, just reproduces itself forever. Outdoors, we see buildings and billboards that seem to go on forever, vertically as well as horizontally, keeping us from seeing anything else. The corridors and streets stretching forever into the distance represent the totality, the inescapability of the modern state. 
We get the impression the state covers the whole world, that the same state could plant its same gray buildings everywhere, slowly pushing life aside to build more. What's the purpose of all these buildings and so on? It's clearly not to give everyone more space. Sam has a claustrophobically small office and doesn't even have his own desk. He works for a system that controls all the world's resources and the system refuses to give him the most basic working conditions. While domination and control are basic functions of the state, the state is also a way for its agents to avoid accountability. We see it first here. The state? <laughs> We don't make mistakes. Or if we do make mistakes, it was someone else's fault. Bloody typical. They've gone back to metric without telling us. Sure, there are millions of decisions being made arbitrarily and millions of scraps of paper that could lead to wrongful arrest, but states don't like to admit to fallibility. So if someone was wrongfully arrested, no one actually has to do anything different. I only know you got the wrong man. Well, information transit got the wrong man. I got the right man. The wrong man was delivered to me as the right man. I accepted him on good faith as the right man. Was I wrong? It's better to process the wrong man than to reverse an official decision. And you won't get in trouble because there's always someone to pass the buck to. Only in his dreams does Sam confront his own complicity with this system. How would a citizen hold anyone to account for bureaucratic mistakes? And which person would they hold to account? Even Mr. Heltman, the highest ranking bureaucrat we meet, doesn't seem to be able to make decisions. When you need an answer but no one can authorize anyone to stamp the form permitting you to have one, you might get a bit frustrated. Displacing blame onto others is an advantage of working for the state, but it's also one way states prevent justice and change. To be told no by a decision maker is at least an answer. You can move on and figure out what to do next. At least when one petitioned a monarch, there was the chance they would be a fair adjudicator. When justice is found in the stamps and signatures of bureaucrats in impenetrable offices, it's effectively unavailable. You might spend years trying to get approval and end up hearing no anyway. Or your application could be lost forever and you might never get the answer. Or you might get mistaken for a wanted criminal and get sent for processing. Or you might get so frustrated by the process you lose control and do something that makes you a criminal. Bureaucracy is one of an arsenal of weapons the state has to use against us to curtail the slightest rocking of the boat. Life outside the oppressiveness of the city is only shown in fantasy. I think this choice is made to parallel how, in our world, you can leave work and the grind, but only temporarily, for a couple of weeks a year. You kind of imagine you're getting away, but you can never really escape. In Brazil, you're not even really allowed out of the city, except on a kind of vacation chain gang. I like to interpret the name of the movie as a reference not to Brazil specifically, but some faraway land Sam would run to if he could. Sam being an everyman, his dream of escaping modern life is familiar to the audience. Maybe to Sam, Brazil is this place where he could be a hero. Not here where he's hemmed in on all sides, but over there where there is no bureaucracy. No grey buildings and grey desks and grey faces. Where they could start a new life together, somewhere too distant to be real. It's common practice for the powerful in any society to give the people enemies. Those enemies include the external enemy, like that bad country we had to start that war with, and the internal enemy, who's going to bring down our awesome system we have. In Brazil, we get the idea the external enemy no longer exists, presumably because a unified state now covers the globe. But states still need enemies, so this one focuses on creating the internal enemy. We suspect him of a freelance subversion. Freelance subversive. People are encouraged to rat on their friends and neighbors, making everyone the internal enemy. Turning civilians against each other because they trust the state over their neighbors is a triumph of propaganda. One of the things that make us human is our need for connection with other people. If you wanted to dehumanize us, you could isolate us from each other. You would destroy community and civil society, making organized dissent impossible. If people never learn to empathize, they can step over each other on the way to the mall. In Brazil, children playing are always playing as police, 
arresting and pointing guns at each other because that's the world they know. A world of repression and cruelty. If people don't learn compassion, they can easily participate in harmful, cruel work and go home and sleep at night. What if you feel the urge to snitch on your neighbors for any reason? You don't want to feel guilty for your role in their processing. There are no friends because what if you end up having to do unspeakable harm to your friend and then play with your daughter? Each of their victims is just paperwork to them. Because they're so disconnected from each other and don't know how life could be, most people in Brazil come across as not quite human. People dress the same. They have no outlets for creativity, no space to grow and change. Workers work because they have to, not because they see any value in the work. The purpose and outcome of their labor is to reproduce the system and the work it creates for them. Just work at the jobs that get created, drive on the roads we're given to drive on, accept the identities given to us by consumer goods, take two-week vacations, and then go back to work. Other people are just means to those ends. This mindset turns us all callous and unable to relate to one another. Look at the scene of the bombing in the restaurant. A bomb goes off. People are dead. People are injured. But the customers just one table away from the victims expect the service and even the music to continue. Yeah, those people are hurting. I don't see why it should cut into my lunch. Sam's relationship to Jill the heroine is another example. He doesn't know how to treat Jill like a real person, only as an object of his desire. In Sam's dream, Jill's helpless, symbolized by being naked, and gives herself to him. In reality, she's pretty much the opposite. Not interested in this weird guy who dropped out of the sky and says he dreams about her, and capable of defending herself. In this world of isolation, many people have only the merest ability to socialize, and Sam doesn't seem to know any women other than his mom and her friends. He might not really understand the line between a woman, a complex, full-fledged human being, and a fantasy, a silhouette of a person he doesn't know. In pretty much all dystopias, most of the people around the characters are unaware they're in a dystopia and just think that's what life is. People are made to feel powerless, so they get apathetic, avoid responsibility, or live in denial. Since they assume nothing can change, they try to make the best of their own lives. So instead of trying to improve their minds, they work on their appearances. Instead of questioning their place in this system, they try to get promoted for the minor benefits it brings. The main character of dystopian fiction is usually an everyman who somehow wakes up and becomes a hero, or leads others to victory, or at least finds a way to escape. In Brazil, however, there is no hope. No way out. No limits to the power of the state, and therefore, no freedom. Sam wants to be a hero, somehow. If only you could be a hero without taking a risk. If only there were a clear monster to fight and heroine to rescue. If only an opportunity for heroism would present itself. Not realizing, you have to create those opportunities yourself. Instead, he can only be a hero in his imagination. And since there is no hope... No escape from the suits and the uniforms. He can only get rescued in his head, too. One response to the total state and apathetic society is random acts of violence. When Jill questions the social benefit of the giant bureaucracy Sam works for, his response is irrelevant, but actually pretty typical. I suppose you'd rather have terrorists. If you don't approve of government policy, you must want the terrorists to win. Jill responds... How many terrorists have you met, Sam? Actual terrorists. She's questioning Sam's knowledge, but her question has made viewers of this movie wonder if these bombings might be false flags. But I assume they're real. Terrorism is about sending a message. The first bombing is of a consumer goods store and kills a consumer pushing a cart full of products. The next one is in a fancy restaurant. The third is in a mall. I think it's an obvious response to people angry about their enslavement. If you can't change anything because all your power has been taken away, you might want to tear down everything, which can only be done by violence. The state uses the metaphor of a game to describe the total enforcement it claims is necessary to stop the bombings, because a game implies fairness. Bad sportsmanship. But states don't play any kind of game I'm familiar with. 
Their idea of playing is for everyone to go to work, spend money, watch TV, and turn in their neighbors. How is it a game when one side has already won and there's no way to challenge them to a rematch? How do you play when one side is a group of people organized to prevent the other players from working together? How do you win a rigged game? You don't. You don't play. You find a way to beat your opponent that's to your advantage. When Sam begins to see the system for what it is, he sees how he can sabotage it. Harry Tuttle has more experience, so he can show Sam how to do it. The Matrix and Dark City take this premise of waking up to how the system works to sci-fi conclusions. But Brazil hides no secrets and no special powers. All Sam can do on his own is tweak the nose of the state and run away. If he had really understood what Tuttle kept saying, We're all in it together, kid. He would have realized he could make a difference through mutual aid, helping people who need help despite the state not authorizing it working with others to achieve goals other than looking younger. When I did my series on the book 1984, I looked at the utter hopelessness of Winston's cause. There was no way to rebel and no one even to confide in. Brazil is the same. There's no happy ending in such a world. But our world is not there just yet. In our time, it's easier to find others and organize and attack the system's weak points. We don't have to choose between dystopia and a dream.